Welcome to, good day, and welcome to the Levy Longevity Series. My name is Rob Beatty. I'm one of the board members here at the Levy Senior Center Foundation. I want to thank the Levy Senior Center staff. Uh, Amy Kellogg is here. Brandon is here uh, over to my right. And I want to thank the city of Evanston. And also, I want to thank Endeavor. Uh, for allowing us to have this fine uh, physician here of uh, integrative medicine. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, the restrooms are out to out the door to your right, my left. Um, we also have more uh, restrooms on the other side of the, the, the building uh, if you're here for the first time. Um, Secondly, there are snacks uh, free of charge. Make sure you grab a snack. Uh, this, will, this will be an hour, at least an hour long presentation. And we'll just follow uh, Dr. Temple's instructions uh, for how she wants to move, move through things. And I also would be remiss if I didn't uh, thank the Levy Senior Center Foundation Board uh, for manning the tables and helping with everything. Without further ado, uh, we are now going to give a warm Levy Senior Center Foundation and Levy Senior Center Evanston welcome to Dr. Leslie Mendoza Temple. Okay, I'm going to figure out how to do this real quick with the hair. I had it on perfectly before. Now it's okay. You're going to have to tell me if it looks okay. Am I all over the place? Okay. A um, few things also. I'll, I'll give you an introduction like where where is my training? How did I become uh, tr uh, interested in integrative medicine? What is integrative medicine? Um, another housekeeping tip here is that we got so many questions in advance that we're probably not going to have time for audience questions, unfortunately. But trust me, I really tried to cover as much as possible. We're going to go through a whirlwind of what happens when we age. And so don't get depressed because it's going to seem depressing. But I, trust me, I have potential solutions or helps for that. The other thing, too, is that... Um, we have a lot of people on Zoom. I'm thinking um, hundred over 150 have registered. I saw 85 on. And unfortunately for the Zoom people, we are not going to be able to monitor the chat. So if you have questions, we really can't um, address it because our uh, I, I'm going to be using the same computer to run my slides. So hopefully it will be an okay experience. This will be recorded from what I understand. Um, so... And if you want my slides, we can uh, provide a link. This is too big to email because I like a lot of pictures. Feel free to take pictures of the slides, although I think I'm blocking it. So I apologize uh, for that. But you are recording this. And I didn't make handouts because there's too many. I have 52 slides. A lot of them are pictures. But some of them are word heavy. I will try and summarize because I'm like one of those PowerPoint dependent people. <laughs> I have to look. Because uh, this is uh, only the, maybe the second time I've given this talk, so you get you the third time people get the talk, it'll be really good. <laughs> Apologies in advance. Um, so we're going to talk about not only what happens when we age, not like what happens to your breathing, your digestive tract, all of that, but how can we use lifestyle and integrative therapies and conventional therapies throughout your lifespan. Um, we're going to do a lot about medical cannabis because there were a lot of questions about that. So I'm going to preempt the 28 questions that we received ahead of time that we probably won't get to, which is why we're probably not going to have time for walking around with a microphone and asking questions because those can get kind of out of hand. Um, we'll see what we have time for. I can go till two o'clock. It could be an hour and a half. Please stand up when you need to stretch, walk around. Don't care. Go out, get water, go to the bathroom, come back in and out. This is very hopefully informal. Okay, and so background on me is I um, actually went to undergrad at the University of California, Berkeley. So that's probably where my 
more uh, radical leanings led and looking at things differently, majored in economics and pre-med and decided I wanted to go to medical school. And I applied at a time when everybody wanted to go to med school because we were in a recession. So you had to be a like 5.0 GPA kind of Rhodes Scholar type. And I was like a regular smart person. So I went to school in the Philippines because that's where my aunt went. And that's where I could go get my medical degree. But I'm glad I did that because I got to see how medicine is done in another part of the world that doesn't have the kind of resources we do. Lots of herbal medicines, lots of spirituality. So I went after I went to med school in the Philippines, I came back and did my residency at Northwestern. Um, and I that's where I met my husband in Evanston Hospital CCU, a very romantic place. Not really, but uh, he's the other Dr. Temple. Uh, and he's an emergency medicine physician and runs all of the North Shore immediate cares. So if you have any complaints, talk to that one. Okay, so we are now Endeavor Health, which used to be Evanston Northwest, Northwestern Healthcare, remember in the old days, and then became North Shore University Health System. We divorced Northwestern University and got married to the University of Chicago, and now we're called the... Um, Anyway, with all these name changes, I never went anywhere else. And we are now called Endeavor Health, merged with uh, Edwards Elmhurst Hospital, Swedish Northwest Community Hospital. So, um, and at the very end of this talk, I'm gonna talk about navigating the health system because finding a primary doc, finding a specialist, getting in is so difficult. So I'm gonna give you some tips. So this is a, a living physician, Dr. Gladys McGarry, 102 years old, who just published this book on what she thinks healthy living is about. And she is one of the founders of the integrative medicine movement. If you've heard of Andrew Weil, who's a mentor of mine, she, she's been there since the beginning as well. At 102, she, she wrote that most people think that the role of medicine is just for us to promote the physical body and put a stop to whatever ails us. But the greater aim is to create a suitably healthy environment, which includes your body and uh, where the soul can fulfill its purpose. So I really like that she brings in not just this physical self. There's so much to life than just making it to a certain age. Um, so here's the depressing part. So like I, like I said, caveat, don't be <laughs> depressed. But the rate of aging for a 45-year-old woman, I'm 54, I should have re reversed that, I'm 54 that I'm aging at the same rate as an 85 years young woman. But the difference is that by the time someone is 85, they've accumulated more wear and tear wisdom as well. I wouldn't, I mean, gosh, the collective wisdom in this room. Oh, I, I can't imagine you can solve world problems with what you have all been through. Um, but the age related change is the, the trade off. Uh, so it's kind of like the rusty gears. You just, kind of lose a little bit of that fluidity. And as we age, there are a gazillion things that happen on a cellular level. I'm not going to go into the individual. If anyone here is a biomedical person uh, into this, we have cells that have a certain uh, expiration date governed by the telomeres in the DNA. And those things get shorter with stress and cells die. And then you have less cells available to do the work. Um, I look at... Um, when we're younger, it's like starting off with a corporation with 100 employees, and you have a lot of people there to do the work. And then as you get older, you now have 80 employees to do the same amount of work. And then when you get older and older, it's like now you got 50 employees to do the same amount of work. And so as those cells start to um, just go away, that's, that's why things seem to get more difficult. So there are many hallmarks of aging. Um, and so this is not the best advice, like the don't get old advice. <laughs> I hear that all the time, but it's also, it's good to get old. You, you have wisdom, you have other things that, that happen. It's the bodily stuff. If you could just take your, your 60 year old or 80 year old mind and put it in your 20 year old body. Can you just imagine? Okay. So the heart, what happens? Um, as we age, your cardiac output, the ability for the heart to release blood into all of the circulation goes down after, starting in your 30s. After the first year, goes about 1% a year after you start turning 30. Okay, depressing fact number one, the stiffness of the heart muscle starts to increase 
as you get more fibrosis replacing muscle over time. So muscle is what contracts and expands. Fibers just kind of stick around. They don't do much. And then the arteries become stiffer and become more uh, clogged up with stuff, particularly plaque. But you can have a beautiful cholesterol profile and still have a heart attack if you have a lot of inflammation uh, circulating your body from high blood sugars, from too many toxins, uh, alcohol, cigarettes, not sleeping, stress, all of those things add to the burden. For the breathing, um, our respiratory treat, starting in our 20s, the vital capacity of the lungs, the amount of air that goes in and out just can start going down. That's why staying as fit as you can, and today is the youngest day you're going to be, it's never too late to do something. Tomorrow you're older and it's just hard, it gets harder and harder to try and make it happen. So start while as young as possible to create a lot of cardiovascular fitness. Your elasticity, think about fibrosis, right? Elasticity is back and forth, but if things get fibrotic, they don't expand and contract as well. And that goes down as we get older. Um, the ability to clear mucus slows down because your mucociliary, these little hairs that beat mucus and gets pollens and pollution out when you cough it up, that slows down. And in smokers, it can even be paralyzed. So it gets hard to clear infections or allergies when that apparatus is slow. So we stay sicker a bit longer. And there's also a drying up of the saliva, and it can also increase the risk of aspirating bacteria that don't belong in the lungs, into the lungs, and then you get things like aspiration pneumonia. In the digestion, uh, the esophagus. So think about your esophagus, your, your digestive tract is one big tube. It's, it's not like a cow that branches off into two separate stomachs. It's one tube in and an exit out. So your, your mouth, the esophagus, food goes down into the stomach. Stomach's filled with acid and it's filled with acid for a reason. So when we're on acid blocking medications for years and years, um, there can be downside effects with trouble absorbing your nutrients and bone density problems, um, aspiration pneumonia. Proton pump inhibitors work for a short period of time, but they're not meant to be forever drugs. And so the acid is in there to kill germs and to help start the digestion process. Stomach grinds it up then small intestine absorbs your nutrients so that it can replace worn out parts, carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. And then your large intestine is in charge of sucking out the water so that um, you don't get dehydrated and your bowel movements come out formed. So that's the ideal situation. It's one muscular tube that propulses and does different things along the way. So when the esophageal motility slows down, then you can get reflux, you can have trouble um, eating or getting full really fast. Um, the colon can become hypotonic, meaning that it doesn't um, stretch as much. There we go. Okay. Let me just do this here. Um, and things take longer to progress. So people be can become constipated or have less frequent bowel movements. So if you eat less and then you don't have as many much movement going on there, that doesn't feel fun. And then sphincter control can be lost or reduced from childbirth or injuries. And so if the sphincter is not keeping everything in and stuff can leak out. And so that's, these can be very difficult. Uh, and the kidney and bladder, I always think of this as the, my corporate or my soldiers, you don't have as many soldiers working in the kidneys. And so the volume and the weight of the kidneys, they actually decrease over time. They just get smaller. And the number of functioning units that filter your blood and create urine goes down. The bladder capacity reduces. So uh, who remembers the days in their 20s? They could hold it for like all day and then go. Now it's like, I'm already on the aisle on the airplane because I don't want to wake up the person because I'm up all the time. So I'm, I'm 54, so I'm really in for it. <laughs> Reduce bladder capacity and an increase in an uninhibited contraction. So that feeling of, oh my gosh, I have to go like right now and living your life, knowing where the bathroom is can be very limiting, especially if you wanna travel, you wanna go somewhere. Um, so that can happen. And in the reproductive system in, in, in women, uh, I think of it as the great shrinking, the drying up process. <laughs> and that's where um, everything just gets, you know, as we, 
come out of our reproductive ages, no longer making an egg every month and ovulating and not getting that fertilized and then having a period over and over again, that happens until around the age of 50, we go into menopause, the ovaries cease working, they, their job is done, but then the estrogen and progesterone levels go down a lot, vaginal dryness and thing, all kinds of fun stuff happen. But it's also uh, important, estrogen port is important for your memory, your brain, um, for bone density, so many things, but we also don't want to have too much estrogen on board because we worry about blood clots, heart attacks, strokes, breast cancer, and ovarian. So there's a whole thing about whether to do hormone replacement therapy or not. I prefer to do it in women who are more in that perimenopausal time in their forties to 55, where you're giving something to help smooth the transition. But I do have some women who are on it longer. And in the men, um, there's also the aging of the male reproductive tract, in particular, the prostate, where things just, it's very normal to have urinary problems as a man, as by age 80, more than well, pretty much everyone has some sort of urinary symptom. And if you don't, lucky you, just just 10%, lucky you, but look, oh my gosh, is that a cricket ball, the size, a prostate the size of a cricket ball? Oh my gosh. So there's things that can be done with that. Um, bones, muscles, and joints. I got the most questions about this osteoarthritis, aches and pains. This is part of that gear analogy, things getting a little rusty and stiffer, but also bone density decreases. As I mentioned with estrogen, if you've had to take steroids, like maybe a history of asthma or some condition that requires repeated oral steroid use, then that can reduce your bone density. That's a risk for fractures. So my other thing is the don't get old and don't fall. So you can't do anything about the don't get old part, but you know, not falling requires a mindfulness, an awareness of your surroundings. You've probably heard it over and over again, but prevent the problem from starting in the first place with mindful movement, good balance and strength. But starting in our forties, the bones start going down at 10% every 10 years for women because of the estrogen and 5% uh, every decade for men. So everybody's bone density goes down. And when someone says, oh my gosh, my bone density tests, it went down. I'm like, of course it's going to go down. You, you just want it to go down slowly, not some big crash because that's when the doc is going to talk about bone density medications, but definitely calcium, vitamin D and doing the work. When you are doing squats and you're doing things that tell your bones and muscles, you need to hold me up and you load it with weights. There's no medicine that replaces exercise. So that's really key. And then lean body muscle declines with atrophy of the muscles. They get replaced with fat. Yay, collagen too. But that's not where you want the collagen. And then the joints, they it's wear and tear, literally. Uh, if there's anything that you do a lot of, the repetitive um, things, they just, the joints wear out. So being mindful of things that maybe you're doing now, if you're starting to see an ache, modifying the way you do it is key. And that's hard because if it's walking, you want to keep walking. You want to stay independent. So depending on the circumstance, the wear and tear mechanisms um, can either affect you a lot or they're not that big of a deal. It's very, it's very nonspecific answer to how do I deal with osteoarthritis pain? I'll talk about it. And then in the skin, um, this is actually a reporter who did a time modeling of herself at this age and then what she might look like as she gets older. And why does skin look different as we get older is that with age, the layer of the skin, the atrophy occurs over time, especially in sun exposed areas. So for those who've had like, you know, love to tan and remember those reflector things and coating yourself with uh, oil and all that, that sometimes shows up way later in life as like things that you have to get burned off, which is not fun because I hear people say, well, I put sunscreen on now, but I'm like, did you do it when you were 16? That's what, you're, that's what we're dealing with now. So also never too late to protect your skin. Um, the dermal epidermal junction flattens over time and the cells just don't turn over as fast. So less soldiers, less employees to keep everything plump and filled up. And the collagen like muscles become less pliable, stiffer, um, we, and we lose elasticity and all that stuff that keeps everything north. So everything kind of feels like it's heading south, but you know, beauty is a concept it's in the eye of the beholder. And I, you know, say that, um, people can go really 
overboard with the the beauty thing and the cosmetic stuff and there are folks who are really judgy about oh that person got botox i'd never do that to myself i'm like you know truth in the middle it has to be where that person feels best and remember there's also other things you have to do for yourself to be healthy but um, outer appearance i do think is you know it's worthwhile to care about and not be judgmental about okay and blood flow also decreases so if you have less blood flow then that's going to be uh, a problem for your tissues to replace themselves. In the endocrine system, we are at, we all actually have the same number of fat cells our whole life. They just can get more full, like sacks, <laughs> or they can get real empty. So when they get full, that's when you know weight goes up, up and places dimple that you didn't like. You where did this come from? Um, all of that happens because we lose insulin resistant. We lose insulin sensitivity over time the number of receptors just fall off. And so even just the risk of getting diabetes goes up as we get older. Um, and insulin resistance is like the, um, it's the signal for a cell to open its doors and let the sugar in from the meal you had. Even if it's the healthiest meal on the planet, if that glucose from the digestive process is just floating around in your bloodstream, that's like rust. So the more the rust is sitting on the metal, it's gonna rust and damage cells and that's called free radical damage. So you want that glucose from your healthy meal to go immediately into the cells where they belong to power the cells. So insulin resistance can occur. And that's why we don't like diabetes because it hurts the eyes, the nerves, the heart, the kidneys, really everywhere and increases risks for things like cancer and dementia. So um, the pancreas loses its number of insulin producing cells. So even the insulin that it makes is a bit less depending. Um, and as we mentioned, lean muscle mass just goes down and that's the muscles actually have more insulin sensitivity than fat cells. So the more muscle, muscular, muscular you are, the higher your metabolic rate is just sitting there versus having a lot of body, a lot more body fat around. So weight training is important. If someone's like, yeah, I walk every day. I I'm doing my swimming and all that. That is wonderful. Keep going. But if you're looking for another thing to level up on your fitness is to get weights going twice a week. If you want to change your body um, and figure out a way to do it without hurting yourself, either online um, with a trainer, group fitness classes, this looks like a great place here that you have a lot of that uh, promoted. Okay. And in the brain, this one's a popular one. Our volume of brain just goes down over time. That really stinks. This is the scariest one, but uh, the volume declines with age at a rate of around 5% every 10 years, starting in our forties. And so uh, what do you think are the, mo what's, what do you think is the number one way to protect your brain from atrophy? Use it. Okay. So using it, number one, and exercise and using it means staying socially engaged, intellectually involved, social, socially and intellectually stimulated. So the worst thing to do would be sit and watch TV on the same program over and over on a couch all day and not get up, not talk to anybody. That's a nice way to not grow any memory. So if you're someone who's like, oh, I do some of that. <laughs> what could I do that's different? There we go. We got a yay over there. Okay. Because these are synapses. As you lose them, you can also build new ones up. We, we still have neuroplasticity. We just have to keep at it. So protective factors also include the diet. Your blood sugars are really important. And even in some of the um, literature on, um, for instance, seizures, following a more low carb um, kind of diet, meaning sugar and white flour and white, all of those things are not good, especially if you have an insulin resistance tendency um, that can, you know, cutting down on sugar by a lot is important. Um, there's no hundred percent. I have an 80, 20 rule, do a good job. 80% of the time with whatever I'm recommending, get a B minus, but for your whole life, because if you get an A plus on your performance, you can do that for what sustain it for like three weeks. And then we go back to our old ways. So be a, um, B minus student on that. Okay. So it seems like it's all bad news and it's all uphill, but there are a lot of things you can do to lighten your burdens. Um, nutrition, movement. I like this one. Have friends 
be the friend that's in the middle. Depending on where you are in the age spectrum, make really young friends and make really old friends. And if you're in that part where like, wow, I don't have a lot of older friends, well then make friends with younger folks. It's it's like hedging your bets, like in a stock portfolio, the more diverse your portfolio of friends are, the better insurance I think you have with mental health, having help if you need it. Um, but it's very difficult if there haven't been a lot of relationships formed and it's just you and you don't have any really anyone else. Maybe you moved here and all of your people are in another state. It's, it's very important for the brain health and quality of life. Uh, family relationships, um, trying to work on healing, anything that is causing a lot of angst. Of course, financial stability helps a strong spiritual practice if you believe, uh, whether it's in religion or not. I think it's important. Uh, traditional Chinese medicine, prevent accidents, have some good luck. That always helps. A positive mindset. So um, that's really important too, cultivating gratitude and all that. That's, that takes work when things don't feel like they're going that well. It actually feels the opposite of uh, for many times when things aren't going well. Watch the news. It's very hard to cultivate a positive mindset with everything that's going on. Having a safe place to live, doing things like massage, chiropractic care. I mentioned acupuncture earlier. Limit the pollution that's going inside of your body, whether it's the air, the water, the food. Um, limit watching the news and social media. Just know what you need to know. But when we watch the same thing over and over again, rehashed in 10 different ways, how much do we need to know that at 10 p.m.? And my parents love watching news at 10 p.m. Why? Why? That has such a bad habit. To go to bed with the worst facts in your mind, how do you let go? And that's what sleep is about, is letting go of the day and letting your mind just take over and letting your body heal from the day-to-day -day wear and tear. Um, taking supplements and vitamins, maybe, depends. If your diet needs it or there's a certain nutrient missing. And don't take yourself too seriously. Okay, so lightening your burdens. Um, I mentioned gratitude to all those things. You hear there's not one thing, right? There's not one treatment for whatever. It's all of these things that lighten your burdens because aging is inevitable. It's going to happen, but can you slow down the process and make it not so um, dire and significant? Okay, this is the part where I get into like in an integrative setting. What do people do when you know with certain scenarios? And I get the I get sick every year question. So I'm going to give you practical tips other than you know to rest and hydrate well. Your chicken noodle soup. Keep your stress levels low and re definitely rest. But oregano oil, this one's one of my favorites. It's disgusting, horrible. It's like taking five Altoids in your mouth and drinking grapefruit juice afterwards. But it kills everything it touches and you can swallow it. This is just one brand. I don't have any relationship with any herbal companies. But as soon as you feel that little tickle in your throat, I put a couple drops of oregano oil under my tongue, swallow it, make a face. I can feel it burning. And I even feel it going in my ears a little bit but it's killing everything it touches. If you can catch it early on, this might save you from a, a, the 10 day cold, it could, but then you have to rest. Sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes you still have the full blown cold and you don't wanna do this, but you can do it multiple times a day. Take your vitamin C, take your vitamin D. They are important for your immune function, especially D where we live. We're pretty far North on the planet. Our sunshine exposure isn't that long. So most of us will need vitamin D. Vitamin C is nice. You don't have to take it year round, but for most people, it's safe to take vitamin C year round. Um, you urinate out the rest. It's just some people get an upset stomach because it is acidic. But then again, get your vitamin C also from food. Um, zinc, uh, we were big into that during COVID, but I don't think we should be taking it year round. It can upset your copper zinc balance. And if it's summer and you're really not worried about getting sick, skip your zinc, but maybe take it only during cold and flu season which I would say is like October to March, March, April. Um, there's also a spray I really like. It, it's nasal, uh, sorry, it's saline spray, which you can do, use a neti pot, which is salt and water in a little tea, uh, teacup looking thing or something a little more portable. This is just one example, X clear, where it's salt, water, grapefruit seed extract and xylitol. And it just rinses the cooties off and the pollen grains and you do like three spritzes each side to clean your nose out. So I think that's really nice. If you think you came around, you were around a lot of sick people, you went to a big concert, family wedding, 
and you know, you're worried you might get sick or someone was sneezing around you, or you're starting to feel ill. That you can do as many times as you want. And then I love this mushroom spray called MycoShield. There's many other iterations. It's got maitake, um, uh, agaricon mushroom. These also have disinfectant properties for the throat. So the idea of these sprays are to decrease the amount of viral or bacterial load so that your body can get rid of the rest. If you rest and you got rid of like 10,000 germs through these disinfection methods, you might save yourself from getting sick maybe one in three times, two in three times. I have, this is my, my patient swear by this slide. Okay, and you can get this at Whole Foods. There's also a really nice wellness shop connected to my office. I make nothing off the sales of supplements. So these are just the brands that work for us. If you're in Glenview though, the wellness shop, those sales support the program overall. And we do um, work on giving away free treatments for our patients who can't afford um, the out-of-pocket expense. So if you were like, hey, I wanna support a small business, go to the Glenview Wellness Shop. Okay, so that one, I'll just leave that up for a little bit. I see some folks taking pictures. Okay, and I can always go back to that too. Um, I'll move on. Okay. Oh, don't forget traditional Chinese medicine, acupuncture, Chinese herbs. Awesome for upper respiratory infections. Awesome for many things. I got questions about when would you use it? I love acupuncture and herbs, especially for digestive problems, irritable bowel, Crohn's, um, ulcerative colitis, feeling queasy from chemotherapy. There's a lot I think that you can benefit from. Um, also pain. I mean, I really can't think of much that traditional Chinese medicine doesn't cover. It's just that it's not covered by insurance. That is the, the downside. But if you can get it, we are live in a place that has three schools. We've got Midwest College of Oriental Medicine in Skokie, Pacific College of Oriental Medicine in the Loop, which is like 25 or $30 a session. And then I think uh, now up in Racine, they have um, schools there. And of course, I have three practitioners who are wonderful. So we do deal with a lot of stuff. Okay, I've uh, got questions about how do you deal with cancer. So when I see someone who's about to embark or is in a cancer journey, so this is an example, a 69 years young woman with new diagnosis of stage two colon cancer discovered on colonoscopy. So she was feeling fine. She was still working full time, health conscious. How could this happen to me? No family history. Things like this happen all the time. Um, and that's why the screening is important, but you have to get into your GI. So if you're due for your colonoscopy, call like nine months ahead. I have no solution for that. You just have to get ahead and um, get on their schedule if it's time for your screening. So she's gonna have surgery and chemotherapy afterwards. And she's concerned about the side effects and what, what can I do that's not gonna interfere with the treatment. So I, this is a long list, but. I'm, no one has ever said, I really wish you didn't tell me to take time off of work. So take time off work. It's really hard if that's not possible. There's a great book. If you're ever going into surgery called Prepare for Surgery, Heal Faster by Peggy Huddleston, where it's like a mind body prep. You actually write a script of what you want the surgeon to say while you're under anesthesia. And it seems very strange that they're reading and you're like totally out. But that is a time when your subconscious is wide open to suggestion. You're, almost, you're in a hypnotic state. So why not have someone read to you something that you want said that you will have minimal discomfort during this procedure. All the cancer cells will be removed. You will wake up feeling very functional, like program those things. Um, you'll be healed of this malady. You'll dream of the winning lottery numbers. You know, whatever it is that you want. I always like throw in something funny because it gets the OR staff a little lighthearted. Started. And they'll remember, I think it helps the OR staff know there's like a person underneath the sheet instead of just the square that they're about to cut into. So anyway, patients always go, I don't know if my surgeon's going to do that. I'm like, just do it. They just tell me your kooky integrative doc told you to do that. So that's in that book. And then you also ask your loved ones to pray for you, meditate for you during the time you're in the OR. Um, I think all that good energy is, is well spent. I like vitamin C before and after surgery. And there's two homeopathic medicines I like uh, right afterwards to promote the wound healing, which is Arnica and Staphys agria. Every A lot of people know Arnica. Staphys agria, hardly anyone knows. They'll be in the slides. I'm not going to take time to spell it. It takes too long. But it's 
for post-operative healing. And they're really just sugar pills for those who are like, oh, homeopathy, that's just crazy hooey stuff. Well, for $8 a tube of it, just being a sugar pill with inert substance on it, that sounds pretty safe to me. So at least I know not giving anything harmful, but I do think there's something that can be therapeutic about them and knowing you're doing something a little more than the standard of care. Uh, and prep for chemo. This is another tip I don't hear a lot. It's not, it's a little controversial, but not super controversial is to not eat a whole lot before chemo sessions. Like give it a day, um, 24 hours before you know you're gonna get the IV and just stay really well hydrated and eat light. That, that might help a person tolerate their chemotherapy better. I've heard though, uh, others say in the nursing group, no, oh, you have to eat. So you have to do what feels right. If you feel lightheaded, then eat something. That's the easy solution to fasting, eat something. Um, acupuncture, I wish acupuncture were available for every person going through a cancer treatment because it can really help the side effects. Okay, and medical cannabis for symptom relief. I'll go over that in a bit. Aromatherapy for relaxation, if there's nausea, unless you can't stand the smell of anything. Uh, relaxation therapies are very important. Mindfulness, um, gratitude, working hard on cultivating that positive mindset, healthy distractions. You already, this person's already getting all these toxic things put in their body. Let's focus on positive, good things. Okay, so traditional Chinese medicine. I went over that a little bit, but... Uh, Raise hands. Who's had acupuncture before in the group? Lots of people. Oh, wonderful. So do you know, we actually, I got uh, a um, foundation grant to give free acupuncture away to our Evanston Township High School students. They are actually, we're the only program in the country. It's the only place in the country that, or the world, I don't know the world, the country that gives acupuncture to their students. And that's because of a generous um, set of donors who helped with that. And so that piece, whether young or old, um, this has been around 3,000 years or more. If it didn't work, it wouldn't be around. Um, so that's my uh, elevator speech on that. Very low risk thing to try if you can. Um, this is an important, not important. This is a fun tidbit of fact. If you ever felt nauseous, there's a point called pericardium six. If you're feeling motion sick or feeling uh, nauseous from chemo or anything, this is also for uh, morning sickness for pregnant women. The C band is this little band that goes on the pericardium six point in your wrist. It's three finger breath, three finger breaths from your wrist crease on this little tendon right here. So if you ever felt nauseous or you're feeling motion sick, press on that on both sides if you can. But the C band actually just keeps that pressure on with that white button that's there. The electronic C band's much more expensive, but I love this because I'm a, the queen of motion sickness. I'm on a boat and feeding fish. <laughs> I'm just not I'm really fun to be around. And I discovered this, I don't know if it's placebo, but it gives an electrical signal that stimulates that point. And I have saved my car, my motion sick kids who get car sick, when they feel that way, I slap this on them and it has saved me hours of cleaning up my car from sick kids. So I swear by this, but it's like a $250 device um, you can't see that, but it says reliefband.com. Again, no endorsements. There's a, There are others online too you can find, but the, it's all based on traditional Chinese medicine, the acupuncture anti-nausea point. Okay, um, so I'm gonna get into medical cannabis. We got a lot of questions about what to do with pain, what's it for. I have certified a lot of patients in integrative medicine, I think we're probably the earliest adapters of cannabis and other ideas, including the field of psychedelics used in mental health. Um, we're just probably more open-minded than um, conventional physicians. So this is one where I've had a lot of um, patients go through. And here's a kind of classic case where a 72 years young man with spinal stenosis and PTSD says, I smoke a joint every day. And that's the only thing that helps my help, my pain and my mood. So the doctor thing, and he often feels queasy. So this is, these are important points to note. So he's smoking pot all the time. He's not eating edibles. He feels queasy. So this is a kind of a complex case. This is something I actually talk about with my residents. So you're getting a medical school lecture right now. So something that's come up about heart disease in cannabis came up with a, um, um, a huge study 
on the association of cannabis use with cardiovascular outcomes in U.S. adults. This is a journal of the American Heart Association, huge journal, found that those who had smoked cannabis had a greater chance of having a heart attack or stroke. Now, this is, when I look at that, we all like, oh no, you know, I'm a big supporter of medical cannabis for its proper use. But when you see something like this, like, do I tell everyone to stop? And I looked further into this and found that it was mostly smokers or vapors who had this outcome. And so I, before I reach conclusions, I'd like to see someone compare the folks who use edibles and topicals versus the smokers, vapors. So my view is, I think you, you should still look at medical cannabis, but try not to inhale it. Don't go through the lungs as much as possible. But on the flip side, one of the benefits of the inhaled version is it hits quickly and it leaves faster. It's also the least expensive way. So for those who don't have the mean, economic means to buy all these fancy edibles and patches, this may be their only point of access. So I'm never judgy or weird about, oh, you're smoking it every day. I'll say, well, there's this study. Um, if you have high cholesterol and history of heart disease, it's probably not a good idea. Let's switch you. Let's do edibles more. Let's do the drops. Let's give your lungs a break because every time you do smoke or vape, you're introducing pollution into your lungs, even though it, there's a medicine in there too. So anyway, that's my view. And the smoking, the cannabis smokers were almost 74% of the study. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna skip over that here, that they did not mention the difference between edibles and topical. I said that already. Okay, so you remember that part where I said he's feeling queasy all the time, but he's using cannabis all the time? There is a thing called cannabis hyperemesis syndrome where the cannabis itself makes you feel queasy and nauseous. And those folks, the only treatment for that is to stop using it. So there are some just folks who are unfortunately just not able to tolerate it. And they are folks who are showing up in the ER a lot. Just this stuff helps my pain, but I feel so nauseous. Hot showers are kind of the clue. If you feel better with the hot shower or putting a hot water bottle on the belly, you may have a bit of this cannabis hyperemesis syndrome and your only treatment is you gotta find some other way to use uh, or to get pain relief or anxiety relief. Um, different routes of administration this is a very busy slide. I already alluded to um, how does it get into your bloodstream? Through your digestive tract, inhale it in the lungs, on the skin absorbed, or even vaginal suppositories or rectal suppositories. And I gave a little hint about onset with inhaled, hits fast, leaves you faster. With oral, this is where we have to be really careful with edibles is that it can, you can feel it in one or two hours. So if you take too much, the next hour or the next six hours can be really tough where a person can feel very intoxicated, dizzy, even hallucinating. Fortunately, it's not lethal. So we are not aware of anyone who has died of just a purely cannabis overdose, but it can be very inconvenient to feel crappy like that for hours and hours. So if someone is starting a medical cannabis edible, take the little square, cut it into four tiny pieces and take the one fourth and do it one night at a time. The nighttime is the best time to do it because you're sleeping through any of the intoxication part and it can help sleep. So I got a lot of questions about sleep. Probably one of my favorite go-tos, a fourth of an edible, ask the dispensary staff, what do you like for sleep? And if you're not a someone who's an experienced cannabis user, always mention, I'm a beginner. I'm not looking to get intoxicated or high from this. I just want to sleep or just want to manage my pain. Nighttime is the best because then you sleep through all of that and it should be wear, worn off by the morning, hopefully leading to more refreshed sleep and some pain relief. Okay. Um, skin, um, that's also a favorite way to do it because it's very hard to feel a lot of systemic effects of cannabis through the skin. So you could put it on anywhere that hurts. Wow, that's easy. <laughs> um, anywhere that hurts. The thing is, is those bottles are like $60 for something that big. So I like to mix it with magnesium cream and cannabis cream or hemp cream. Take equal parts, mix it in your palm, and then put it wherever it hurts. And you can do it every day, multiple times a day. Sometimes it works on one part, but not another body part. So you don't know until you try. And then suppositories are really nice for more pelvic pain in women. Or if, um, if a man has rectal pain or tailbone pain, I say there's something about putting the suppository close to where the problem is. It's hard to find suppositories. So I've actually had patients make their own using coconut oil, cannabis oil, and watching YouTube videos. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's where it's at. 
I'd love that the dispensaries carried more, but many of them are so focused on the recreational users that the medical patients are really being um, aced out. And they're the ones who built the program. So I have a lot to say about that. Um, and I'm on the medical cannabis advisory board for our Illinois Department of Public Health. And so we're trying to like, hey, you know what? But we can't make any of the dispensaries do anything unless it's by mandate. And it's still um, that um, free market economy and it's the recreational customers that drive their business. So speak up, you know, when you go to a dispensary and say, where are the low THC products? I don't want, I don't want this. How come you only have that? Okay. Cannabis routes. Oh, I've already done this. This is the uh, um, timing. A patch is nice because then you don't even have to taste it. Uh, it stays on your skin. It's the most expensive way to put cannabis in your body because it's like $10 a patch usually, and you only last 12 hours, 10 bucks a day, right? And they're hard to find because mostly medical patients use this, but those are a possibility. Okay, I know we're hitting 118. So um, I already talked about that part. Oh, be wary of accidental ingestion. So anyone who's got a cannabis card, you know, if you've got a grandchild, teenager coming over, whatever, if that looks tasty, in the mouth it goes. And so kids uh, in states that have a cannabis program, they've seen more toxic ingestions come up in the little ones, um, which we know isn't lethal, but they're going to end up in the ER with seda over sedation and hallucination, and you just have to wait for it to wear off, but lock it up. Okay, I'm gonna skip over THC dosing pearls a little bit here because it's the one fourth square that's just, you know, I'm gonna go to a half a square, then three fourths, then one square when you're eating an edible. THC drives the dose. Um, and tinctures are the same. They're like liquid formulas of cannabis. So you wanna look at how much THC is in X number of drops and try to go for like, one to two milligrams of THC each time. Even if it's a baby dose and you feel nothing, I'd rather you be underwhelmed and then you build your, your experience up versus taking too high of a dose and feeling really weird and getting turned off to the whole thing. Okay, man with heart disease. I think um, we've got 10 more minutes, but I, I can keep going as long, but here's a man who's um, had chest pain and weakness. Turns out he's had a heart attack. He got a stent. He was stayed in the hospital, discharged on a statin, aspirin, and blood pressure medication. Referred to cardiac rehab, stress reduction advised, and some diet advice given. It's only so much that can happen in a hospital. And it's usually it's a whirlwind as someone's getting discharged. It's only so much a person can absorb after they've had such an incident. So he comes to me in my clinic and says, I don't want to take that, that Satan drug. <laughs> statin. Um, but because of the potential side effects, but he's had a heart attack. So I'm like, that's a worse side effect than, you know, so if you don't know it, I usually am like, you got to take it. And then as an integrative doc, people are like, think that we don't believe in any drugs or medications. That is not true. It's just that if I have an alternative, I probably have more alternatives. And if there is an alternative, I will tell you. But for someone like that, I'd say you do need to stand and try it. If you hate it, then I have another option. Um, so diet, of course, stress reduction, sleep, um, have them walking, doing cardiac rehab, and then calm the heck down. There has to be a bit massive reduction in the stress with yoga, massage, acupuncture, talk therapy. I like adding coenzyme Q10. If anyone's on a statin, like pravastatin, Lipitor, Zocor, all of those might help the muscle pains. And if he doesn't want to take a statin, there's red yeast rice, which is an alternative. It's the original statin. It actually has lobostatin in it. It's not as strong as prescription and none of the cardiologists like it, but it's at least something if the person cannot tolerate prescription. So, um, and this is a website I like to go to. If you're like, what vitamins are good? Consumerlab.com. It's like a $40 a year subscription. If you're really into herbs and supplements, it'll actually tell you, hey, here's a brand that was rated, pulled it off the shelves. They tested it for purity and uh, efficacy and they break it down with cost. This is one of my favorite red yeast rites, um, it's cholestine. Um, but you know, you only wanna do that under physician supervision and you don't take a statin and red yeast rites together. That's just overdoing it. So here it is again, here's an example of a brand that didn't make the cut, so I wouldn't buy that brand. And that's how you know, okay, because 
there's so many brands out there. This this group doesn't test everything ever made, so at least it gives you a start. Um, this is another database. This is what I tell my med students and residents. If you're a medical person or you're really, really interested in this, you could actually subscribe to this channel here. It's a website that's very in-depth on supplements. It's about $160 a year, so if you're not going to use it much, I'd go with Consumer Lab. This is what I use when I'm trying to figure out does this interact with that person's medication? Buyer beware, where did we get all this stuff? I mentioned the wellness shop. There's also um, like Walsh's, there's Whole Foods, places where you know, I like the small uh, individual businesses to support small businesses, but Amazon's not where I would go for your vitamins. They just got dinged for having sellers, third-party sellers that sell fakes. And this is one actually, Fungi Perfecta, one of my favorite mushroom brands, they had one that was even more expensive than the list price. So you might even think you're getting something better, totally fake. So people paid more. They weren't even saving. So um, Now Brand, the one with the orange label, very popular, very cost conscious brand, also counterfeits on Amazon. So unless you're buying it straight from the manufacturer, if you don't recognize the company, you might as well just go and buy it at brick and mortar for now, unless you're just really in a hurry. So Back to this 102 year old physician, okay? I've talked about a lot of herbs and supplements and the physical body. She says that here are the magic six factors of good living. You're here for a reason. All life needs to move. Love is the most powerful medicine. You're never truly alone. Everything is your teacher. Spend your energy wildly. So I love that. So obviously that's a strategy that's worked for her. And a wise one, woman once told me, I think she might be online. Uh, befriend your situation. She's a talk therapist. So, and that's from Janice Dolis. If you're out there, thank you. Okay, so I covered a lot of questions. I'm not going to have you look at all of this big list of stuff, but I get a lot of questions about, okay, how do I get in to see you? How do I get to see an integrative doc? I just brought on, we just brought on a, a new partner and she's wide open right now. Grab it while you can, because integrative docs are very hard to come by. I have a nine month wait. So I'm not here to advertise that I'm here. You will wait. Um, but Dr. Roy, who's wonderful, who used to work as a primary care internist in Evanston, has gone into integrative medicine, worked at the VA and ran their integrative program, wanted to live closer, work closer to home. And she started with us last week. And this is the time you catch a doctor at the beginning of their career, <laughs> but she's not her career. This is not the beginning of her career, but beginning of opening a practice because you'll get in, you'll have access. And then as time goes by, she will be hard to get in. And what I want to do is recruit more people like the, over there in the corner, the young people, <laughs> um, to start like really seeing, meeting the demands of folks who want more of a holistic solution for their health, but also have that training in like the Western model. MD or DO. Okay, so we're going to take a little commercial break here and stand up because this is a long time for you guys to hear me talk. So we want to stretch, optional, if you want to stay seated, but I want just, let's just do a little stretching here because it's a long time to sit and listen to somebody. Be careful. <laughs> okay, and just do some, just do some twists. Stretch out your hand. Roll your shoulders. And then back and forth, stretch your back. You too in Zoom land. Okay, when you're ready, you can take your seat or get a drink, um, go to the restroom, come back. So that concluded a lot of my medical recommendations. And it is 126. So if you have to go, go. This is the next section is about um, being a savvy patient and some perspectives from a physician's point of view, like why is it so hard right now? Okay. Take a sip. And then for those of you who are gonna wanna stay and listen, if you kindly take your seats. Yes. We have just three of us. Yeah. Okay. We're good. Okay. We're going to start this next pro the next section here. Um, challenges in healthcare. One is physicians seem to be 
we're less responsible for the whole care of an individual. Everybody wants that doctor that does everything. And it's just impossible. And I'll tell you why. It's because we just don't have the time we used to have. We're limited in our physician visits because now we're on what's called a productivity model where the more people you see, the more you make. So of course, that's like, like McDonald's, right? Let's just do everything, like get a lot of people through. So there's no time to spend and there's no way I can cover all of your systems when I only have 15 minutes in the room with you and I have 10 boxes to check. Did you get your mammogram? Did you check your colonoscopy? Blah, 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 blah. Okay, so um, while that's happening, insurance companies are decreasing reimbursement. So physicians are making less than they ever did. So there's a lot of burnout happening amongst my colleagues. And I'm sure that you've felt the brunt of that through short interactions, un, uh, unsatisfying uh, meetings. It's, it's happening on both sides and no one's happy about it. Okay, it's not gonna just, this isn't gonna just be a gripe fest, I promise. But if you understand the pressures in, in how to navigate. Um, so I mentioned too, the healthcare workers uh, burnout's high. Many are leaving the profession. The pandemic really screwed a lot of people um, in terms of leaving and not coming back. They retired early and they haven't been replaced as quickly as they've left. And in primary care, um, a lot of students aren't going into that. Uh, I think we saw a rise in that in the past one year. So there is hope, but we gotta wait for, wait for them to finish their training and then where are they gonna end up? So I always have residents or med students with me and we talk about what's your future, like what do you wanna do? Um, so this holistic approach can be applied to any specialty that I've talked about. Um, and while expertise and acceptance of lifestyle is increasing, it's still not really mainstream. You go to other parts of the country and you talk about meditation, I think you have two heads. You know, I think this is, this community is so progressive. The fact that I could get an acupuncture program in your high school with minimal, actually like no stat, no friction. They're like, when can you start? And then we tried another city, I won't say, we tried to offer it and they're like, well, what is this acupuncture stuff? I'm like, oh, Evanston, Evanston, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so depending on where you're at, um, you're gonna see acceptance or not. So those are some challenges. And we, um, your challenge is finding a physician that accepts your insurance and, and fits your philosophy. You can find people who fit your insurance, but they're just don't not a good fit and you're stuck. That's really hard. I don't know what to say or do about that, but uh, I say what to do. Everybody feels that way. Um, okay, so here's some ways to help promote a better relationship with what you've got, which is to make sure you're your records, if you're transferring care, make sure your records are available at the time of visit and not say things like, it's in my chart. I have a list of pet peeves that are coming, okay? Um, another pet peeve is complaining long about other doctors or going on and on about how the healthcare system has messed me up. Like, yes, I'm a listening voice, but if you're gonna spend your 30 minutes with me yammering on about how some something I can't do anything about, you're losing time with the doctor in front of you. So but there is a lot to be said and to be heard. So my skill has been balancing enough listening with, okay, now we need to move on to another topic um, and not allowing enough time for the doctor to respond to your question. Um, but I know that when patients see me, if it's taken nine months, they're trying to machine gun them all out. And I'm still on question number three and they've moved on to question number six. And that's all anxiety and wanting to get as much as you can. But if you can't hear what we're saying, then you know, there's a lot lost and it's very frustrating on both ends. Having too long of an agenda for the time allotted, it's better to try and be seen more frequently and just cover quality topics in a short, you know, in the short time that you have and be real realistic that maybe you can cover three things and not seven or eight. Not returning for regular follow-ups is advice. The pet peeve, um, using the portal to ask really complex questions. So North Shore Connect is my friend and enemy because I can never escape it. We're on call 24 seven. So by the time a person has written an, um, an email and they're going to part two on a new, that means you need to just call the office and get in the, on the schedule. Because um, imagine an um, inbox, I'll have like 30 and I don't have the biggest practice, but if I have a practice of 30 questions in my queue and it takes me four or five minutes to answer each one, how much time am I spending 
instead of being with my family at night. So if you have a question that's complex, call the office and make an appointment because it's just going to be handled better in person than back and forth emails. But I know that oftentimes that's the only way you can get an answer. Um, and we understand that. So um, another pet peeve is if your nutritionist asks for a big list of lab tests and they say, ask your doctor to order it, I have to actually hand put all of those in and diagnose link that. And then I'm on the hook for the result. But honestly, if you're for a, for instance, a man who's not menstruating, that's not vegetarian, I don't really have to know their iron and ferritin levels. So there's these, there's these things where they just get, some of my patients will get from the holistic community, a list of all these labs they want their doctor to order. And I'm like, no, you need to, mm -mm, I don't do that. <laughs> um, and the saying, it should be in my chart when I ask a question, like when was, when was the diagnosis? When did that happen? Oh, it's in my chart. I'm like, well, okay. <laughs> I'll look it up and we'll take time from that. So try to, you know, be ready. Or if you have a timeline of what you have, I have solutions. Um, and then the twofer bringing in like, um, uh, another relative during your visit and saying, I want to also work on this person. Oh, I get sometimes. And I'll say, you know what, I can address a question, but that's your time that you're taking from your patient. And I'm not your doctor yet. So I'm liable for anything I'm advising in that setting. So try not to do that. Set up another appointment and try not to slip the extra relative or friend under the radar. Um, that happens more in, p in peds. <laughs> The three, the two kids and then four kids show up to the visit, that happens. Um, and I get it, parents are like, they don't have time. Long-winded stories without a clear path on what the goals are for the visit. That one is also takes a lot of skill to, uh, to manage. And again, not listening deeply enough to the physician's recommendations. When we are expected to do the same, and in defense of doctors all the time, I hear my doctor wouldn't listen to me, my doctor wouldn't listen to me. I can't tell you how many times my patient wouldn't listen to me. It goes both ways. Grumpy cat. Okay. Um, some solutions, bring your records. Just go a year back, summarize it. This happened, this, this like bullet points so that I can get just a general gestalt. I see people with a lot of complex issues. Don't bring like though, like a stack that's like two inches deep. It's okay to vent. Don't take the whole time doing it though. Pick top three priority topics. Schedule your follow-up before you go. Keep your messages brief to the point. Um, make a timeline I mentioned. Um, bring your meds and your supplement bottles with you. I actually, some docs hate seeing the big bottle. I like seeing that because it's hard for me to look up online each individual list. I want to see the ingredients on the label. And then we sit there and go, this you don't need, this you need, this you need, this has a better brand. And I'll tailor a supplement regimen based on what I see so that you don't have to buy more stuff. If you have good stuff at home, we'll use it. And be kind to the PSA and the medical assistants and the nursing staff. It goes a long way because I will get a heads up when we have someone who's not nice, it's been rude on the phone, it's Mrs. Jones. You can just tell. So if, and none of that is you, but you know people that are not nice to other people and they're only nice to the doctor, we know who those people are, okay? It does change the way we perceive a person. We're human as well. Because if someone's been rude to my staff, um, then you know, my, maybe I might not go the above and beyond for them because, you know. But for someone I like really love, like I will be like, well, what do you want? I will give it to you. What do you want? So we're human, as I said, and it's just about being um, polite and civil. Happy kid. Okay, so that's everything. And then the hand on the door question: Don't save it till the very end, because again, time is limited. So. Figure out what it is that's keeping you from broaching that. And unfortunately, if you're meeting a doctor for the first time and you're not ready to talk about erectile dysfunction right away or vaginal, whatever, you know, sometimes you just have to lead with it because you're just not going to have enough time. Um, and then you're going to have to come back and it takes hard to get in again. So find ways to bravely ask the hard questions at the beginning of the appointment rather than the end. So this is my team, we're in the Glen, um, and we have, someone had asked how many physicians we have. We have me, Dr. G Geeta Maker-Clark, who will be transitioning to the Park Center in Evanston. She does see people in Evanston, but she's gonna be moving over to, sorry, Glenview. And then Dr. Debjani Roy, who um, has just joined our practice. She's full-time, wide open, as I mentioned, and hopefully we'll be recruiting more. Thank you, and that's it.
Okay. How do we do? Ooh, 137, not bad. Okay. Hour and seven minutes. Thank you. <laughs> oh, um, okay. Feel free to stay or not. I'm going to see if there are any um, questions. Yeah, that we're not covered on here. First, I'm going to go with these because these folks sent their stuff in. What's the best way to prevent or prolong disease? As all those things in the balloons, it's eat very well most of the time and keep moving. Um, why does the medical profession pr push drugs for the treatment of type two diabetes instead of nutrition and exercise? I think that's a reflection of time in the office. We kind of presume people are know they're supposed to diet and exercise, but we have to spend so much time telling people how to take the medication properly. And when the time is very short, that's all the time you get is that, you know, it's unfortunate. And that's also why the endocrine department will have diabetes educators and things like that. Um, but it's, we need that to change. Um, and again, we're in this in model where we're trying to see as many people as we can. These are all excuses, I know, but it's true. What are the earlier signs of dementia that family members should look for in a loved one? And um, you kind of know, like when there's, um, the person's not the same, they, they're subtle, they're subtle, but the thing is what to do about it. And um, having the, the rep repetition, the person's not quite who they are. Um, now, it, now, if your radar is up for that, figure out like what's missing in their life. Are they not hearing well? Because if they can't hear well or see well, then they're not getting the input they need. And maybe that's it. There might be wax in the ears. And sometimes people will just get their ears flushed by the ENT and they're like, oh my gosh, I can hear again. Um, vision as well, if they can't read and they're just missing the interaction because there's coming in, in with a film. Um, if they're not moving very much, try and go for walks, do things that they enjoy. It's, it's hard also caring for someone who has dementia because if they're you can lead a horse to water, but they won't drink. My mom has this and I'm her, you know, I tell her, mom, I make X number of dollars an hour and you're not listening to me. <laughs> but, you know, she has diabetes and she's not never been a very active person. So taking her now at this point, it's kind of too late. So I'm just letting her, I just want her to enjoy her life. Um, and that's trying to push, you know, and the person's goals are not yours and they're happy just sitting watching TV and they're good. There is, it's very hard to watch and I have no easy solution because I'm going through it myself and doing what I do, banging my head against the wall. And then I realized, you know what, this is your life too. These are her choices. Um, it's just hard when it affects other people a lot. It's hard. It's, every day is a different battle. Uh, fifth question, what's an ideal diet for someone who doesn't enjoy cooking? Now I eat fruits, vegetables, and frozen dinners. So actually frozen veggies and fruits are great because they're picked like time of ripeness and they're captured and you can keep them for a while. It gets hard to, you know, schlep back and forth from the grocery store, the farmer's market, or if you live in an area where there's not a lot of access to fresh foods, that's going to be an issue. So the frozen dinner question depends on a frozen dinner, right? Is it the Swanson Salisbury steak? I remember growing up on those. That was one of the latchkey kids. You remember hamburger helper with the, I would take a frozen hunk of like ground beef. And then I thought that was so good. <laughs> not anymore um so there are ways to also eat healthfully it takes preparation like beans and oatmeal these are things that are not very expensive but you can still eat foods that look close to how they came out of the earth out of a tree but the prep is important it's the fast food the processed stuff food that can stay good for eight months you know that that's probably not good now, if we were in armageddon and like you know we were <laughs> <laughs> just trying to survive and you just eat whatever you can. But right now we're, we have still have access, um, but it's a, it's a tricky question, a loaded one too. because Not everyone has access to good, healthy food choices. Um, let's see. We talked about arthritis pain. Um, I talked about cannabis a lot, but people ask about glucosamine. It helps maybe take the edge off the pain. Um, it's for osteoarthritis, which is wear and tear of joints. That can be helpful. You could try it. If it's not working after three months on the prescribed doses, then maybe it's not going to help um, at all. But don't give a, an herb or supplement just a couple of weeks. If it doesn't work, don't just toss it out. Um, sleep stuff, though, I like melatonin for people who have trouble falling asleep. 
And I like things like valerian root, passion flower, the cannabis to help with the staying asleep part. So there are a lot of combination products that will have melatonin and valerian root in these big combinations. In the wellness shop, the, the one that's at my office, we have like one of the best sleep formulas, um, different kinds, liposomal that you pump in the mouth. It gets absorbed through the blood vessels of the mouth or you swallow it. Um, and then of course I mentioned the dispensary um, helps. Um, ooh, so question about arthritis exercises. I think the water is really, really important so that there's, there's movement, but not a lot of jarring uh, weight bearing stuff to wear and tear. And that's where I would get into physical therapy and have somebody show you those exercises. Um, pharmaceuticals and CBD, that's okay. So the difference between CBD and cannabis is that CBD comes from hemp. Hemp is allowed to be sold in gas stations, grocery stores, because it has less than 0.1, no, 0.3% uh, uh, THC in the formula. So it's not supposed to be intoxicating. So um, CBD can interact, but we still have to learn a lot more about it. So anyone on anti-seizure med medicines or Coumadin, like the big blood thinners, th those are generally the folks I'm like, okay, let's make sure you sit down with a physician and go through whether this sh you should do it or not. Because there's always alternatives to what CBD can do as well. Um, okay, how do we, inv oh, inv non-invasive integrative ways to manage severe sciatic pain, acupuncture, chiropractic, massage therapy, physical therapy, stretching, heat, cold. Um, you got to try what helps you feel better and to keep moving. Um, that one is hard when it's severe. My mom has that too. We had to build one of those chair lifts that goes up the stairs and around so they didn't have to move out of their house. Um, it's rough when she has those flare ups and there's nothing, you know, I just massage her and I'm not even there. They're in California. She'll get epidurals. She kind of just waits for the next one and the next one, but um, still manages. So um, let's see. How do we deal with decreasing height? Do you know why we get shorter as we get older? It's, it's the discs, right? Someone's doing this. You're, the discs that cushion your vertebra, they just dry out a little bit. So they shrink. So you literally lose the volume and the height in your spine. So that part, I don't know how, but it, you know, posture is really important. Just right now, everyone who might be sitting and slumping, shoulders back and down, your gut slightly engaged, feet on the floor, and your head tilted forward a little bit. So that if you were balancing a book on your head or you're walking by some like old sweetheart, you want to look good, you know, you just suck it in a little bit and stand up straighter. Um, but that, that kind of thing also helps with your musculature and your core. I could go on and on. So tell me when I need to go. <laughs> this is 145. It seems like I'm getting through the questions pretty well. Um, uh, okay. I'm not sure. One asked about best sources to find trusted support groups. I guess it depends on for what support, like here, here. Um, depending on the topic. And someone asked about extreme tinnitus, which is ringing in the ears. It's a really tricky one, but there is some new technology coming out that uh, has a person wear a probe that gives electrical stimulation on the tongue with headphones on to retrain the brain from the sound um, and transmitting sensations to the tongue. It's called the Lanier device, L-E-N-I-E-R-E. -E -E. And I looked up, because I've been following them for a while, but they um, there's one clinic in Illinois that offers it. I have no idea how much. Everything's always really expensive when it first comes out. And then someone will invent it and it'll be $200 over time. There's also another device I like for sinuses. It's um, people who get a lot of sinus congestion. It's called Sonu, S-O-N-U. And that one provides a vibration to your sinus cavities that helps promote drainage. Really interesting stuff coming out about non-invasive ways. I like red light therapy too, from that pain perspective, using infrared and red light on anything that hurts. And those devices are coming down in price as well. Low risk to try for not only skin, but for joints. So there's there's a ton of things we could talk about, but I feel like uh, we're, our brains are getting full and then the stuff is seeping out, <laughs> especially for me. So um, I know you dying to ask a question, so go right in.
one thing you keep mentioning, don't question me, Bob. I believe I have longevity in my family. My father lived to 94, his father was 97, but my his aunt was 102. Wow. I definitely, and, my, and his sisters were both in the 90s. I don't know if I have my mother's or my father's genes, but, it, but whatever I have, I'll leave. The question for the audience was about longevity, and someone in the audience said they have relatives that have lived into their 90s and hundreds. It's hard to know which side you're going to be on, but um, I have, I really don't know how to predict that. You know, also, do you look like them? There's, okay, and your spiritual grounding? Never is my time, I'm ready. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's a beautiful thing. It's so, uh-huh. Oh yeah, big. I think it was in one of my 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 balloon lifting slides. Yeah, yeah. Agree. And agree. Laughter is the best medicine. Was the thing. Um, yes, and then you. How do you deal with people who are on medications for depression? Oh goodness, that's a that's a big one. Yeah, yeah, it depends on how depressed, how functional they are. Um, medications are really not that great unless, yeah. Oh, ECT, yeah, by the time someone's really depressed and they've got ECT, they've had, they've probably tried a lot of different meds. They've had to head shock therapy. Um, and, you know, that's been shown to be helpful, but you can have some memory loss from it. Um, I think as far as mild depression goes, it can be managed with medications and talk therapy. It tends, meds tend to numb the sadness and the pain of being depressed, but I've yet to fix, find something that makes people happy. The circumstances of life have everything to do with it. Uh, are they moving? Are they stimulated? Do they have purpose and meaning? Did they have to retire too early and they they can't do what they love. Did they lose function in a body part and they can no longer participate in that thing that they love? And so that part is hard because you got to find what it is. And then I'm very interested in the field of psychedelic medicines for when um, and if something is not working well, uh, it's not for everybody because it has to be paired with psychedelic assisted therapy. You don't just give somebody some magic mushrooms and say, good luck. You have to prepare the person. And it's, there's actually um, House Bill 1, which is on the health, uh, Illinois Senate and House of Representatives to pass psilocybin for legal use in a controlled setting, not setting up dispensaries and just selling mushrooms to anybody, but you have to use it in the facility, you have facilitators, and then you don't get to go home with it. So there's a lot of thoughtfulness coming across the pike. MDMA was just approved for, by the FDA for PTSD with psychedelic assisted therapy. So there's a lot of stuff in that world, but I probably won't be able to answer all your questions because I think we're running out of time, but it's a big, like I could do a whole talk on that alone. Yeah, one more. Oh, two more. Oh, you were next, sorry. You were next. heart attack and stroke. What's the difference? So it's a blood clot in the heart is a heart attack, a blood clot in the blood clot in the brain is a stroke. Sometimes we even call them brain attacks. So anytime you have a blood clot obstructing blood flow to a vital organ that must be used all the time, you lose function. And that's why these are vital organs. If they get really hurt, then the rest of the body doesn't get blood and then you can pass away or be very debilitated. If it's a stroke, it can take out whatever center the stroke happened in. Like if it's in the the speech section, you you won't be able to speak. If it's in a spot. so they're both really bad and they really portend to inflammation in the body, cholesterol plaques everywhere, heart disease risk, family history. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm 
me, I'm, I'm an acronym um, arthritis and sciatica, but I am on treatment for sciatica. Mm -hmm. But last year, they're talking about CGA recovery in my back. My primary doctor said, John, go to exercise, um, make your food on control diet. Yeah. I do. Before I walk with him, now I do exercise. I go to physiotherapy, mm -hmm. finish, I'm coming to uh, exercise. That's great. I, I, yes, that's fair. I take the pen, but for now, I don't want to take it. Thank you. Right. We got time for one, one more. more. Reiki, energy, yeah. There just wasn't enough time to mention every. There's always going to be a slide. You didn't say this. You didn't say that. I'm like, well, um, Reiki's wonderful. It's one of the energy modalities. You can be long distance. You can be hands on top. Uh, there are Reiki practitioners that can help with energy um, and sending goods to distant healing and such. There's many, another whole other lecture. Thank you, everyone, for your time and attention. Appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks everyone okay, on Zoom.